me share my screen. Good. Okay. Can everybody see that? Is my screen visible to everybody? Yep. Good. Okay. So let's go back a little bit and ask um, and then see where we left off. So what we said what we said was we were studying the um, the We were studying the simple harmonic oscillator. So this um, equation here. And um, we first solved it with initial conditions that the initial position was zero and the initial velocity was one. And I showed that um, I could then express um, using the general formula that we came up with for a second order linear differential equation expressed in integral equation form, I could express the simple harmonic oscillator equation in this integral equation form. This was an inhomogeneous, um, this was an inhomogeneous Volterra equation, since the y, which is the unknown function, occurs both inside the integral as well as outside the integral. And because I've got one fixed, um, uh, limit on the integral and one variable limit on the integral. This is a type two Volterra equation, right? So the simple harmonic oscillator corresponds to an inhomogeneous type two Volterra equation as we expect. And then I asked, well, what happens if I change the boundary conditions? In particular, what happens if I change from initial conditions where I fix the initial position and the initial velocity to boundary conditions where I solve the problem on an interval from zero to B, say, and I solve for Dirichlet boundary conditions um, in that interval. Well, again, I can simply go ahead and integrate the, the differential equation um, very generally um, twice. And I will end up with this piece here. And this piece is really unknown, right? And in an integral equation, I have my unknown function and the unknown function possibly in an integral. No derivatives of the unknown function. That's an entirely different class of um, problems called integral differential equations, but I'm not going to talk about those um, right now. Okay, so what do, what do we do? What do we do with this thing? <clears throat> okay, so that's where we're starting off with um, the, from today. Well, we can actually find this y prime of naught by imposing the boundary condition. We have two boundary conditions in this problem. We can impose the second boundary condition and see what that gets us. So imposing the second boundary condition, gets us the following. It tells us that y at the boundary b is minus omega squared um, times the integral now going from zero to b of b minus t times y of t dt plus b y prime at zero is equal to zero, um, which means, um, so this is, this equal to zero here is the boundary condition, we're solving Dirichlet boundary conditions. And this comes from our two integrals of the simple harmonic oscillator equation. So this tells us that y prime of zero can be expressed directly in terms of um, y 
and the boundary um, B. So this is omega squared over B times the integral from zero to B of B minus T, Y of T integrated with respect to T. And I can plug this back into um, the solution. So plugging this back in, And we will find that y of x can be written as minus omega squared times the integral from zero to x of x minus t, y of t dt plus omega squared x over b integral from zero to b, b minus t y t dt. Okay, <clears throat> now this doesn't seem particularly enlightening because we still have y of x on this side and y of t on this side. Right, where t is a variable. So I still have something that I have to solve for. So what I can do in this case is let's break up the interval that we're integrating over that we're considering the system on from zero to b into an interval from zero to x and x to b. And in addition, I'm going to use the fact that this is an algebraic statement here, x over b times b minus t minus x minus t is t over b b minus x. Again, this is literally just an, an algebraic statement about reorganizing x's and b's and t's. <clears throat> but what I can do is substitute, um, <coughs> is substitute for this x minus t in here to get that y of x is omega squared integral from zero to x of t over b, b minus x, y of t dt plus omega squared integral from x to b, x over b, b minus t, y of t, dt. Okay. okay, so the reason we wanna do this is because clearly now um, these two terms are on equal footing, right? Their form is identical. In fact, we can go even further than that by defining the kernel k of x and t, I'm going to define as t over b times b minus x if t is less than x or x over b times b minus t if t is bigger than x. 
So everywhere in the first integral, the integration variable running from zero to x, t is less than x. So we're in this condition here. In the second integral, as, x, as t runs from x to b, x being the lower limit of the integral means that t is greater than x everywhere in this um, integral, okay? So I'm in this situation here. So let's put these two things together. Um, and if we do that, then we can see that we can finally write the solution. Again, now for boundary conditions, for boundary data, we have supplied boundary information on the, both ends of the interval, that y of x can be written as omega squared integral from zero to b integral kernel k of x t y of t dt. Notice the following. Here was our solution for, here was, here was what the integral equation corresponding to the simple harmonic oscillator with initial conditions, right? This is what it looked like. It was an inhomogeneous type two Volterra equation, okay? On the other hand, with boundary conditions, Dirichlet boundary conditions fixed at the endpoints, I don't get a, Vol uh, a Volterra equation anymore. I get a homogeneous, So this equation is now a homogeneous um, type two Fredholm equation. Again, Y occurs in the inside and the outside, hence it's type two. It's homogeneous, the inhomogeneous term that has gone away. And it's Fredholm because both of the intervals um, are, uh, sorry, the, the, both of the endpoints of the integral are fixed, unlike in the initial condition case. Moreover, um, the kernel that we've defined, this kernel here, is nothing but the Green's function um, for the differential equation with the specified boundary condition. So this is the Green's function. With specified, with the same boundary conditions. Okay, <clears throat> so these two examples, rather this one example with with the different boundary conditions, illustrate for us the following. It tells us that it tells us that um, we can write down the following two rules. One is a differential equation with the initial condition transforms into a Volterra integral equation. So initial conditions. translate into Volterra problems. And two, that boundary conditions Translate into Fredholm problems.
Okay, so these are two rules of thumbs, uh, rules of thumb that we um, that we have come up with by just studying the harmonic oscillator again. Um, one, one more point: these freedom equations will have as their integral kernel the Green's function with the appropriate boundary condition. Um, whose kernel is just the Green's function for the appropriate problem. Okay, so everything that we've done so far in introducing the idea of integral equations has been fairly general, right? I started off um, and I classified these integral equations and then I said um, that actually, um, you know, we could, we could, by doing some general manipulations, convert a general second order linear differential equation into an integral equation. And depending on the boundary conditions, I would get different integral equations, which I illustrated here with the harmonic oscillator. But clearly, um, these are too general, right? Um, and <coughs> this is like saying I can write down um, you know, integrals in quadrature form for anything you want. But at the end of the day, you actually have to solve the integral equation. You actually have to solve the integral. You have to do the integral. Um, and so how do you do the integral? Well, what we learned, what you've learned through hard fought experience is that um, doing integrals is really a combination of pattern recognition and experience. The more you do, the more patterns you can see, the easier the rest become. Um, so it's worth our while devoting a little bit of time in trying to build this experience and apply it to integral equations, right? So uh, that's what I'd like to do for the, for the remainder of this lecture, which is to, is to try and understand um, how to, um, solve a couple of these integral equations. Now, everything that I'm about to say are really special methods. I fully acknowledge that they're special methods. They're not general techniques for solving integral equations. Um, they're special techniques that apply to specific integral equations. And you'll see how specific they are. And you'll also recognize that you've already solved integral equations in, in your past, right? So the first of these special methods I want to um, to utilize is the method of um, integral transforms. Um, <clears throat> and these methods, the method of integral transforms, um, so to solve integral equations, um, it helps to know or to recognize the integral kernel. Right? If you had to ask me one piece of advice for how to solve integral equations, I would say recognize the integral kernel. Okay, so for very specific choices of kernels, I can solve the integral equation pretty straightforwardly. Okay, and this is using the method of integral transforms. So depending on the kernel, we can use a method of integral transforms. So it's best to actually illustrate this with some examples of how this works. The first of this is <coughs> if I have an integral equation 
So we consider the integral equation of the following form. f of x is equal to these additional factors are just normalization. They're not, they don't play a fundamental role, but let's just use them. One over root two pi integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i x t phi of t dt. So this is an integral equation where our unknown here is phi of t. And this is what we need to solve for. And this f of t is some known function. Okay, so this is specified. So there's an integral equation. It has phi of t that occurs only under the integral sign. Um, and so it's a type one integral equation. It has um, two fixed limits. Um, which means that with two fixed limits, it's a Fredholm type equation, and there's no inhomogeneous term. So this is a homogeneous type one Fredholm um, equation. Okay. Clearly, the kernel of this integral equation, one over root two pi e to the i x t, is the Fourier kernel. Um, and so I can solve this integral equation by using the Fourier transform. So the solution of this is just given by the Fourier transform. Since this kernel is just the Fourier kernel, which I recognize. And the solution then phi of x is one over root two pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus i x t f of t dt, okay? And again, I didn't really have to do any work to write down this solution. I just had to recognize that the integral kernel in the equation, in the integral equation I'm working with is nothing but the Fourier kernel, which means that I can solve this equation by just thinking in terms of Fourier analysis instead of integral equations, <coughs> write down the solution. Any questions? Well, here's another one then. The following inhomogeneous Fred Homo equation of the first kind which I'm gonna write like this, f of x, again, f of x is our known function, the unknown is gonna be phi, is the integral from zero to infinity. Fixed boundaries make this a Fred Holm equation. No inhomogeneous term makes it, an inho makes it a homogeneous, um, a homogeneous type one Fred Holm problem. And again, the key aspect of this is that I recognize that this kernel, e to the minus xt, is the Laplace kernel. Which means that I can immediately write down a solution for phi of x in terms of the inverse Laplace transform 
which I'm going to write down in its Bromwich integral form, integral from minus from some gamma minus i infinity to some gamma plus i infinity um, e to the x t f of t dt. And that's that solution. Any questions? This is all clear, I assume, yeah? Um, does the I infinity there mean that we're basically just coming from the top half of the complex plane and going or from going from the bottom all the way to the top? Yeah. Yeah. With some with some um, gamma chosen in a particular way that that means that all of the poles in the integrand lie to the left of the of the contour of integral uh, of integration right thank you okay um moreover um i can consider equations of the following form so the integral Equation um, f of x equal to the integral from zero to infinity t to the x minus one phi of t dt. Um, here I recognize this might not be as recognizable for you, but I recognize that this thing is what we would call the melon kernel, which means that I can write down the solution again in terms of a melon transform, where phi of x can be written as one over two pi i integral from Again, gamma minus i infinity to gamma plus i infinity, x to the minus t, f of t, dt. Okay, some of you may recognize this form. Um, you would have seen it in integral representations of the gamma function, for example. That's because the gamma function is related to um, the Mellon transform. You will also recognize a similar kind of form as the Laplace uh, transform. That's because the Laplace transform is related to the Mellon transform. Right. And of course, all of these statements can be reversed. In other words, if f of t was my unknown function and phi of t was the known function, and I wrote down everything in highlights here, I could always invert this transform um, to write down, uh, to solve for f in terms of, uh, in terms of phi. Okay. So let's do a concrete example to illustrate how the method of integral transforms works. I wanted to ask, um, hmm. will it be the case generally that when we are uh, finding integral representations of differential equations that we are able to identify a, a kernel that is in a nice form, or is that you kind of just have to get lucky? Um, I missed the first part of the question. Um, when we're writing uh, integral representations of differential equations, um, will we will it often be the case that we find a kernel, or we end up with a kernel that is of a nice uh, usable form, or is it often just going to be sort of a mess? A mess, yeah. Mm. You'll be surprised at how many times in you know mathematical physics that is applied mathematics physics applied sorry mathematics applied to physics. Um, you'll be surprised at how many times when you write down an integral equation for a particular physical system, the in, the kernel of the integral is in recognizable form. So in many physical examples, yes, the integral kernel comes out to be something in a recognizable form. Um, you know, 
So right now, one of the big research programs is um, in uh, scattering amplitudes. And in, in, so this is the study of, of basically, you know, what you would expect in particle physics where you throw something at, at something else and it scatters and you study the constituents um, of that process. Well, it turns out that um, the amplitudes for those processes, um, the, the, you know, the central observable quantities can be expressed in terms of integral representations. And again, this is one of these things where somebody recognized it and suddenly it opened up the whole field completely. The integrand in those uh, uh, integral representations turns out to be um, a Mellon integral. So suddenly, you know, all the technology that you have to do with complex functions and, and, and uh, Mellon transforms just converge and it blows up the entire field. So yes, um, we're going to answer your question. <coughs> More often than not, the integral, the integral kernel turns out to be of a recognizable form. Right, that's very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nature's funny that way. So suppose I consider the following type two Fredholm equation, u of x minus some lambda times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus mod x minus y u of y dy. And this is equal to f of x, right? In this problem, again, my u of x is the unknown that I'm trying to solve for. And f of x is a known specified function. We want to solve for u of x in this. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to assume that this thing is less than a half. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to make this assumption fairly arbitrarily, but you're going to see that this condition that lambda be less than a half um, is going to be important to ensure that integrals converge. Specifically, we're going to come up with an integral representation for um, u of x. And the only way that integral is going to converge is if I take lambda um, to be less than a half. Okay. All right. So I'm going to choose here because I want to solve this problem. The X space kernel mm, K of X and let's say Y equal to delta of X minus Y, the direct delta minus lambda e to the minus x minus y. Why do I want to do that? Because then I can put both of the left-hand side um, functions under the same integral, okay? Where in the first one, if I integrate u of y with respect to the delta function from minus infinity to infinity, um, I will just select out the u of x and then this part stays as, uh, as is. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is my choice. You know, I'm making this choice in order to put um, both, uh, to put the whole left-hand side under one integral. So this choice unifies the left-hand side of this equation. Okay. So what? Well, now let's do some, now let's take some Fourier transforms. Um, in particular, if I take the Fourier transform um, of this K, the kernel, Uh, 
and I call it, let's say, k tilde of k, and I'm defining this to be the Fourier transform of k of x, uh, let's say k of x. This is one minus, I'm not working out the details of the Fourier transforms, I'm assuming that you can do this. Two lambda over k squared plus one, which I can write as k squared plus a squared over k squared plus one, as long as I define this a squared as one minus two lambda. Because I assume that lambda was less than two, one minus two lambda is gonna be some positive number, hence I can write it as a squared. That's one. The second definition I'm gonna need, and I don't really need to do anything with this. I'm just noting that this is my Fourier transform. I'll define u tilde of k to be the Fourier transform of u of x and um, f tilde of k, I'm going to just define to be the Fourier transform of f of x, okay? So then if I Fourier transform um, my whole equation for, for u, then I will find that in k space, this is the statement that k squared plus a squared over k squared plus one, all times u tilde of k is equal to f tilde of k, which of course means that I can solve for u tilde of k. And this is nothing but one plus one minus a squared over over k squared plus a squared. Um, times f tilde of k. And I can immediately invert this Fourier transform and I write um, uh, a in terms of lambda. And this tells me that u of x, the function I'm looking to solve for, is f of x plus lambda over the square root of one minus two lambda integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus the square root of one minus two lambda times mod x minus y times f of y dy and that's the solution and the thing we notice here is that um, <clears throat> this solution is not valid um, when um, as a real solution when lambda is bigger than a, a half and so for the integral to converge i really needed the coefficient the square root in the exponential to be a positive number, and hence I need lambda to be greater uh, to be less than a half. Any questions? All right. So let me stop here, um, and next time I will. So that next Tuesday I will write down a general form for a for a Fredholm um, equation 
and I will use that to solve the so-called Abel um, uh, equation, which is a central equation that pops up in, um, for example, image recognition in, in CAT scans. Um, you need to solve the, um, the Abel equation. Um, so we will do that using the method of um, using the method of integral transforms and the generalization of what we've just done here that I will develop in the next one. And then we'll say something about um, uh, separable kernels where I have a kernel that's a function of x and t that I can split up into a function of x times a function of uh, t. So um, we'll show how when this when the integral kernel is separable, again, you can solve the integral equation in a fairly straightforward way. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you very much. And I will see you guys next week.